Good evening and welcome to Red Compass After Hours, where the best and brightest of the financial services industry let their hair down, unbutton their collars and share their passion for payments. I'm Mike Truter, Director of Digital Ecosystems and Innovation at Red Compass. And in each episode, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Julie Guetta. Let's kick things off. Today, we're very excited to welcome our special guest for today's episode, Enterprise Payments and Core Banking Specialist, Liam Leahy. Liam leads the sales and sales engineering functions for EMEA and the Americas for Thought Machine, a next generation cloud native core banking platform. In a past life, he was also head of enterprise payment solutions for EMEA at Dovetail, which Fiserv acquired in 2017. Liam, you and Julie work together at Dovetail, I understand. She tells me you're a very talented technical architect and uh, also have a unique flair for colorful language. Welcome. Yeah. I remember, <laughs> I remember when Julie started in Dovetail. Uh, it took her a bit of a bit of time to get used to the uh, to the colorful language. <laughs> I learned I learned how to swear with Liam for sure. <laughs> well, that's that's a that's a talent everyone should should have, I guess. <laughs> As this is an after hours chat, I hope everyone has brought along a drink. Uh, mine's not with me; it's chilling in the fridge. I have a Vintuk Lager from Namibia, chilling. Uh, Julie, what's your tipple tonight? Glass of wine. Ah, very impressed. Very impressed. Liam, what, what's wetting your whistle this evening? Uh, I've I brought a cup of coffee as I'm preparing to bath my kids later on. I want to try and be in the best condition possible. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that sounds very, uh, very reasonable. Very, very responsible of you. Okay, let's get down to business then. Uh, for those that don't know, the format is simple. To add a bit of spice and spontaneity, Julie and I don't yet know what the topic is. Instead, Liam will pick the topic from a huge list, and then without any script or preparation, we see where the conversation takes us. There's only one rule in this game. Like the Scottish knife, the skin do. We need to keep things short, sharp, and to the point. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, Liam's topic choice. Let me bring up a list of things for you to choose from, Liam. Give me a second. There we go. So what tickles your fancy tonight? So, so even though they're separate here, I'm going to go for a combination of three that for us are more or less the same thing for, 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 for the engagement that we have at the moment. So a combination of um, fintech innovation and move to cloud. Oh. Three interesting ones, fintech, innovation, and move to cloud. So like I said, so, so I mean, on this list, they're, they're, they're separate and you could discuss them separately. For us and for what we do and for the conversations that we have, they're, they're one and the same or they're all very closely related. So um, I thought it would be interesting to, to, to join them together. Okay. So, well, may maybe you can tell us a, a little bit more about why you guys see them as, as, as joined together. They come as a set. Why are they uh, inseparable from your perspective? So, I mean, going back into the historical background of, of Thought Machine, I guess, I mean, it was, it was founded by a, 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 a bunch of engineers who, who wanted to build whatever they were going to build. It was going to be built based on what they saw and the techniques and what they saw on Google. And it was going to be built to take full advantage of the public cloud, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that um, it was interesting when they, when, they, when they left Google and they entered the financial services industry and they realized that the infrastructure that the banks were sitting on and the incumbent vendors that were servicing into the area were, were I mean, it was, it, was, it, was legacy, it was legacy technologies and legacy platforms that hadn't moved a lot in, in decades in some instances, right? So what they wanted to do was leveraging off of the whole cloud platform stuff they wanted to build platforms that were innovative and would allow the banks to be innovative, right? So that's where the, the combination of move to cloud and, and cloud enablement and innovation comes in. And then the fintech piece is that um, once, they started, once they started down the path of the whole core banking stuff, they realized that there was a very uh, vibrant fintech community, both in London, but then globally, as we started talking to, to wider banks. And they are all interrelated. So in the past, either banks themselves used to build everything themselves. I mean, you're going back 30 or 40 years ago, yeah. or they, they used to take full, full one-stop solutions from the vendors. Um, but, 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 but what our guys realized was that if we do what we did very well, so we innovate and we take advantage of the cloud 
and then there's other world-class fintechs out there and they do what they do very well, it means that if we all collaborate and we work together, it means that what banks would be able to stand up would be world-beating and would beat anything they'd be able to do themselves or, or go and get from, from one-stop vendors. And that's, that's kind of where we are today. I mean, that's our, that's our, that's our engagement in marketplace. Yeah, that's your mantra. So, so the whole ecosystem enablement is, is what you're all about, right? Let, tapping on that ecosystem and enabling people to build, to build something that, that you can't get from a single vendor and you certainly can't get as a bank building yourself. 100%, 100%. So, I mean, so, I mean the line that we take is, is that, I mean, of the big global vendors out there, and we all know who they are, um, they do some stuff very good, they do some stuff mediocre, and some of the stuff, because it's old or whatever, isn't, isn't great. But what that means is that all combined together, best case scenario, you get mediocre, right? But if you can, all the individual components are world-class individually, um, it means that you could end up with a world-class platform. Now, the pitch to the banks, so both the neos, the digitals, um, and the established banks right up to the top of the, the tier ones is that you choose, you should not be constrained by, by, by the mediocre stuff that we're giving to you. So why don't you, you free up your creativity and you decide what the building blocks should be and how they should be assembled so you can build whatever uh, target state or house that you want to build. Which means that, I mean, the advantages you get from that is that you get to unique or offer unique offerings into marketplace. You decide what the distribution channels are. You decide what the combinations and bundles of products are. Um, and you get to become uh, a market leader or an innovative bank, or you get to move quickly or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, so you get the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I can't remember the word. I'm think, trying to think of it, but yeah, it's exactly that, right? The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah, yeah and I, I think like for me, the interesting point is, I mean, definitely this is kind of like music to my ears because for me, I don't see any other options that, you know, um, going to the cloud, using the next gen provider to be in the position where you can one, innovate and two, innovate quickly. Um, the, the, the speed is quite of important. And what I feel is like often, like neo bank and digi bank will get that rather quickly and would like, you know, jump on this. But for incumbents, I feel like, you know, it's, it's almost like fragment, fragmentation. So I understand it's difficult to get on this journey, migrate and so on due to the constraints that they have. But I mean, for me, like not starting is just delay, delaying what will happen and losing time in between effectively. Do you have like the same echo from the market when like you engage with um, incumbent bank? A hundred percent, right. So we have, I mean, we have a lot of uh, engagements going on on a worldwide basis with, with the largest banks on the planet, right? US, Canadian, European, um, Asian out, out of Singapore and Hong Kong, etc. Now, it's interesting because, I mean, we started to see this in Dovetail, right, Julie, when we were there, um, about this migration to cloud. Um, and we could see that there was a shift coming. We could see that the big banks were starting, they were starting to look at their cost bases, they were starting to look at what it was costing them to, to operate both the technology platforms they built and then the human beings that they needed to have around just to keep things going. And then the opportunity cost of not being able to... to to launch new products, to be able to attack new markets, et cetera, right? And we could see that from, a, from a, 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 an exec perspective, they were starting to instruct um, the, their organizations to start taking cloud seriously, right? The regulators had started doing it, and you could see it. I mean, all of a sudden, we were getting asked in Dovetail, for instance, um, are, you, are, you, are you deployable on the cloud? Are you efficiently deployable in the cloud? Which at the time, we were saying yes, but we weren't really, right? But you could, you could still see the way the conversation was going. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so, and I mean, that was one of the reasons that when the opportunity came up to move to a place like Top Machine, who, who, who were starting their journey um, saying that they were never going to be anything other than cloud native, right? So, I mean, that, that chimed, right? But then when we started having conversations with the banks, so you could see, right, we want to do something with the cloud, but, but it is, it, we are terrified of doing anything with our existing platforms. I mean, we've got huge volumes and numbers of accounts and customers on mainframes. And it, it, it's not the best thing that... The, in the market out there, but it works for now, right? And the and the cost and risk of migrating in a big bang terrified them, right? So then we started to see different banks doing different things. So for us, Standard Chartered out of Hong Kong decided to go down the route of taking one of the new e-money licenses and launching a brand new digital bank, right? So come up with brand new product proposition, attack the, a new segment of the marketplace, which for them was um, affluent millennials who traveled a lot, believe it or not, and then pick the technology platform that would enable them or allow them to do it. And their plan was that at some point in the future, then 
they would be able to start migrating legacy bank onto this new platform. And they're on that journey today. I mean, Mox is up and running and live. They're, they're adding huge numbers of new customers. And they're after taking another one of the new uh, e-money licenses in, in Singapore and continuing with that journey. But we also realized that when we came back to Europe and went to the US with that story, the response that we were getting from the big banks was, we're not interested in digital banks. So we see the, the DigiBank approach in Asia is pretty big. There's lots of e-money licenses being launched out of um, Malaysia, Thailand, et cetera. But we're not seeing that in Europe or, or the US. And, and the response we got to that approach here was, it, it seems like a great idea, but we're afraid that it's going to split our brand, split our customer base and add cost. So now what we're seeing is, and this is where really the cloud comes in. So a lot of the big banks have partnerships with clouds is that for now, what you want to be able to do is move quickly. You want to be able to enhance your, your, product, um, your product proposition and product creation capabilities. You want to be able to compete with some of the fintechs that are entering the marketplace, compete with some of the stuff that the big uh, tech giants like Apple are doing. So why don't you leverage the cloud platform that you've got? Why don't you leverage the new technologies that are out there like us and other fintechs? Integrate into what you've got already that you like and start off by launching innovative products through your existing channels and then take a progressive approach then as you, as you hit successful milestones and you're able to show to your executives this work, you're able to, you're able to get return on investment quickly and then start migrating on, on a piece by piece basis or on, on chunks that are consumable that won't blow you up the rest of the platform. And that's what we're starting to see the, the large established banks doing in, in, in Europe and the US. So it's a slightly different approach, but you're right. Sorry, that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but the banks are absolutely seeing the cost of not moving. They have to do something. We're seeing different approaches, but but we are now starting to see them all move. It's a global phenomenon. Yeah. yeah uh, Julie and I often talk about the kind of the move to 24 by seven, you know, RTGS platforms like India moving to 24 by seven now. Actually, there's no time for batch windows anymore or, or, or upgrade cycles. Um, you know, we're taking a weekend off because we've got to do an upgrade. It just doesn't work in the future, right? We're, Absolutely not. The future is always on um, 24 by 7 globally, right? And what's, interesting, and what's interesting about that, though, right, was that um, so you'd expect that in the retail space, but retail is pretty simple, right? Especially on the so the neo fintech, the digis issuing uh, checking accounts. Um, so they are able to stand up relatively simple platforms that are 24 by seven, right? Um, when you get into the more complicated stuff, especially around mortgages um, is where the legacy platforms are struggling and they need windows to be able to do all the, the big complicated interest calculations. But we're even seeing it in the corporate space, right? So yeah. corporate tended to be nine to five, uh, five days a week, you have plenty of time to shut down your systems and do your upgrades and everything else. That is moving, right? We're, we're seeing the big banks building consolidated systems offering global coverage which means that they can never turn off yeah. but yeah i think i think that's totally makes sense and like to be fair you know we always said like yeah covid uh, has, has accelerated the change and so on but like when I, I was reading some article right about like um before brexit um six to eight weeks before brexit effectively about like you know how like a car manufacturer based in asia wanted to ship the car as much as possible so that they would arrive in the UK before like, you know, the, ta the new tax regime apply and so on. This is not possible if it's not powered by effectively like, you know, a bank that allow you to pay like 24 seven and so on. Because if you need to wait like two days to make your payment, then like the ship has gone literally like, you know, so how, how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. And you can see then, like, I mean, there's increased competition. I mean, it's been interesting with COVID as well, too. I mean, there was a change in dynamic. So before before COVID, you had you had the rise of the of the neo banks. I mean, Monzo and these guys going through explosive growth, but with no, no business model to make cash. And then in COVID, you could see a flight to safety, right? So the big banks had the had the balance sheets to be able to issue lending and 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 people moved their own money into the established banks. And then you saw them coming back into the fore. And then there was a big realization that actually there is a place in the future for these established banks but they do need to move and i mean we saw a wave of interest towards the back end of last year and i mean the start of this year has been crazy absolutely crazy i mean we can see we can basically it looks like the entire market is moving at the same time yeah, yeah. and just like one question that uh, we kind of seen in the market you know so i think definitely the, the cloud is on the hype and everyone want to migrate to like you know this this new type of in infrastructure rightly so right um but what we see as well is 
all of a sudden, like, you know, people don't want to move into one cloud, but several cloud. And for me, it's a bit like, wait, learn how to walk first and then you can run, you know, instead of like running to, wanted to run from the start. But I'm curious to hear your opinion on this, Liam. So, so I mean, I mean, we see this a lot, especially with the established banks. I think what they're afraid of is, is, is vendor capture, right? So if you go in to a single cloud, whichever one they are without naming them, uh, you, you build your platform using their direct services. It means that in the future, I mean, if you're completely reliant on a single cloud and you can't even threaten them that, that look, we are already set up to fail over onto a different one. I mean, then it means that, I mean, you're captured. If, if, if the cost of getting off the platform is prohibitive, it means then that at some point in the future, the vendor can charge you whatever they want. And I mean, then you're at systemic risk anyway. So, so I agree with you, right? So yeah, learn to walk. Although we do tend to find there are lots of clever people working in these banks. I mean, the institutions might be, might be old and clunky, but they do have clever people working in there. They just, they're, just as, they're not just not as nimble as the, as the digi guys. But it is, it is important that on your migration journey onto the cloud that you are sensible. I mean, you're, you're building your, your platform so that you're not completely reliant on, on a single vendor. Um, and even whether that, means, whether that means that you can fail over from one cloud to the other or that you distribute your services across multiple different clouds, or you go on a hybrid model, which we see, right? I mean, there's, yeah. there's lots of platforms out there that allow you to, to keep your data centers but have, um, have easy access to your, um, to your private cloud through one of the, the public cloud vendors. I mean. There's, there's lots of different ways of doing it. And I mean, again, in comparison to where we were, Julie, in Dovetail, where we saw the very, the very, very early days of this, um, and there was lots of POCs and maybe burst traffic moving onto cloud. We now are seeing core systemic traffic moving, and there's plenty of patterns. There's plenty of patterns for the bank to use, and also a lot of the, the large global consultancies have built practices that they understand how they should work, and, and they understand how the, the bank should implement. Plus, we're also seeing that the vendors are telling the banks that they can't re be reliant on single clothes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and to be fair, um, like even sorry, like even the main vendor, right? Like if I if I think of like you know kind of the traditional vendors, they are they are partnering with different type of like cloud and also like advertising the fact that you know they can like um, the product can be plugged to different type of cloud as well. So. Yeah, there's also regulation coming with uh, operational resilience, right? Um, yeah. In doing that, so, so people have to think seriously about, about concentration risk and, and all of their, their critical services as well. So, I mean, you have that, you, you have, like, we are seeing that it, a lot of it is being developed across the world, but you have it, you have it specifically in the, in the EU under the EBA guidelines, and you have it in the UK under the CISCA guidelines, and the regulators in the US are very, they're very strong on it. I mean, so, so both the bank's resilience on its platforms, but also the bank's understanding of its of the resilience of its vendors yeah i, I was wondering on on kind of uh, the broad access if we can come back to the ecosystem thing um synergy was the word i was looking for earlier but the the, the kind of greater the greater good um synergies in the market and um and and core banking and and payment platforms um what, what do you think are the kind of really interesting developments that you see in terms of people connecting different bits together to create innovative new solutions do you, do, you, do you see there's anything specific that's really tickling your fancy or that you think is this could be the next big thing in terms of how people are innovating with with the ecosystems that are available and the players that are, are there in the market? There is there is some interesting things out there. Um, I mean, if you walk, I always had this image in my mind as to what a bank looks like and what the components, what the components are. Um, I think what Form 3 have done in the payment space is 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 pretty awesome. I mean, um, we could see it on the, on because I mean, payment schemes across the world, they're all different. There's loads of them. The regulation changes on an ongoing basis. It's a difficult business to be in. We've found that since the big guys took out the, the, the payment processing platforms like Dovetail, like FinTech, like clear to pay nobody's come in to fill their space. Um, uh, there's, lots of, there's, there's lots of areas that don't have a lot of coverage. So I think, I think this path now the Form 3 are taking, which is just we are going to provide access to the schemes as a, as a hosted service on an ongoing basis. You can figure out what to do on the other side of it, but we are just going to make it easier and take away that pain. I think they've done a phenomenal job. I mean, I met those guys when Michael Muller was their, was their first employee and it wasn't 100% clear as to what they were going to be doing. But the journey they've gone on and what they've done is phenomenal. And we can definitely see it in the UK that they make it easier for these fintechs to be able to get onto payment rails. And, and the more that they spread that journey across the, the globe, it'll make things very interesting. Um, the reg tech side, again, so one of the huge expenses 
one of the huge expenses that you got um, trying to launch a bank and one of the reasons that you would have had to go to the big players is your reliance on those guys that they understood regulation and they were able to generate, they, they were able to get access to the data and then generate the reports that were required for various different entities, the, the, the regulation bodies, the, 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 the oversight bodies, et cetera. Um, the, the emergence of reg tech, and there's loads of it around the place, right? But that has, that has provided huge numbers of options now on a global basis, depending on the region that you're in, that again, takes away that pain, right? So, and again, as we're seeing that split out, I mean, it's democratizing. That's why you're seeing so many of these digibanks and stuff growing up is because a lot of this that was enclosed in, in large black boxes owned by the large firms is now being broken out and it, democrat, it democratizes access to people, to the technology to be able to launch these banks. And then the stuff that they're doing on the innovation side, which is on the customer channels like so, whether it's the PFM platforms or how to manage your cash or insight into spending and all that stuff. I mean, that's the, that's the benefits you're getting from the democratization on the back end for what the fintech community is doing, right? So, so you're seeing innovation on the channels, but re in reality, it's being powered by this this fintech community and breaking out the the magic, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Like, I I, I couldn't agree more. I think like, you know, like not only they brought like the tech that what required to basically launch financial services product, but at a cost that is really making this possible as well, right? Um, right? If you think of like what's the cost of like, you know, a dovetail project, for example, as opposed to like a form three subscription model, you're not looking at the same. Right. So that's huge, that's huge as well too. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if you would call this innovation or not, but, but the move, so the problem with, and it wasn't just dovetail by the way, I mean, it was, it was the way the industry used to work. If you wanted to get into a build, right? You wanted to build something from new or you wanted to, you wanted to, to implement a new platform. Uh, so you went through the sales cycle, it's 18 months. You have to, you have to get enough confidence up front to your due diligence that you're willing to sign a committed five-year contract uh, and all the commitments that go with it. So basically what you were doing was, number one, you had to get access to the funds and then you had to make a bet, am I confident that I'm, I'm willing to pay for success up front? The subscription payment model turns that on its head. It means that number one, you don't have to raise the cash up front. It means that you, on this pay as you go or pay as you grow, it means that, and you can and you can build as your volumes are growing. It means that you're not taking all that risk up front, right? So, and that that approach to charging in the industry, which us and and a lot of the rest of the fintech and our competitors take into this, uh, is revolutionary. I mean, it is it is what has allowed a lot of the fintechs to launch. They would not have been able to launch without it. And now we're seeing seeing that the big uh, that the big um, established banks are also taking advantage of this. It means that traditionally where you would have had execs betting their career on, on starting off one of these programs and they would never get to see the end of it even though they've committed huge amounts of money up front, right? What we're now seeing is, is that that risk isn't there. They can get quick return on investment because of that subscription approach. So, hey, bank, superior exec, we would like to do this. We would like to spend this amount of money up front. If we get to success, then we can decide whether we keep going or not. That's what the, the subscription price model gives you. I was wondering for, for kind of um, more conservative banks, you know, when, when you have conversations with them, you know, that, that they're nervous of the cloud because security, you know, uh, and so on. And, and they've, they've invested in all those systems that they're running and, and it's the only way they know to work. How do you, how do you convince them slowly but surely? I mean, we've been through a lot of good, good things, but is there, is there kind of one killer point that, that you think, um, we're still looking for to, to kind of make people switch or see the light that they have to do this? Not on the cloud migration piece. I think, I mean, we, because we've seen its evolution over the years. I mean, even, even three years ago, yes, right? But today, and I think it's a function of what the, the, big, the big global cloud pairs have done a phenomenal job in working with the regulators, in working with the largest banks in each region and convincing the regulators and then convincing the large banks and doing publicity drives and everything else that, Security as a question is gone. Nobody questions this. In fact, what it now transpires is that no individual bank will ever have a, 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 a concentration of the type of security experts that the cloud platforms have. You just can't compete, right? And considering that they have all these resources focused okay, into right. this, they are more secure than what the banks are. So don't, like, don't even raise it as a question. It, it doesn't make any sense. And even if you wanted to, the regulator is going to tell you is that it's, it's not a concern of theirs, so it shouldn't be a concern of yours. So, so that piece isn't the question. And, and we can see that 
again, because of the way that the cloud vendors are selling their services, um, so they also operate on, on subscription and volume models, which means that they're effectively giving access to these platforms at low cost and then allowing the banks to test stuff out. So, I mean, I haven't seen any bank in all of my journeys where they aren't doing something, right? Where the questions arise is, hold on a second, what am I going to do with the, with the really important traffic I have though, right? Um, concerns around GDPR and data location and data residency, um, stuff around um, moving the stuff that's on the mainframe and the, and the, are not necessarily the mainframe, but the legacy systems that work and are driving most of the business at the bank. So moving that stuff, right? And that's where that's where our conversation comes in, which is we completely understand that the cost and risk of of, of big bang approach to migration um, is is probably not worth the, the 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 cost to risk ratio or the or the reward to risk ratio, right? But but like we said earlier, you can't risk not not moving, right? So let's focus on let's focus on some short term wins low risk low cost quick return on investment right and we and we start to focus on some of that stuff and, and it's like that cloud platform that you've got let's show you what that can really do if you took a cloud native platform a platform that was built to run and take full advantage of of everything that that thing can do and why don't we show you what that running on that cloud platform looks like and show you the benefits of it right and 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 set it up or take on something small so that you, you can see its benefits and you're generating benefits immediately, right? Don't try and, and yeah. bite the whole apple whole, right? One bite at a time. And let's focus on, let's focus on, on stuff that is valuable to you, whether that is being able to launch a product into a new market segment, whether that is being able to acquire new business and grow, whether that is um, being able to, to do bundling that you haven't been able to do before on different types of products, whatever it is, keep it small, Keep it, keep it so that it's it's easy to understand. It's a clear win for you in the bank. It's a business gain if it works, and then but it also starts to prove out other stuff. I think, I think that's interesting. That's uh, sorry, yeah. Mike. I, I think it's interesting because like effectively, it's a bit more the like the more innovation you want to do, then the stronger your backbone has to be. Effectively, this is this is in 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 a sense what you're saying and. Um, yes, okay, you may not be like fully confident to uh, embark on this journey, but try with one innovation. And then right away, you basically see the benefits and then right. be more confident. Okay. To you, can, you can almost you know, suck it and see, <laughs> and you right. don't have to risk very much to do it. So it's, it's actually perfect, right? So yes, if you're conservative, that's fine. Let's try this one little thing, right? And learn a lesson from it. And who knows, you know, you might get addicted and and, and off you go, and, and uh, in fact, that, that will be the path forward. It, it's logical. I, I love that, yeah, Liam, there, there is no choice, right? Um, there isn't, there isn't. And we can... it, it might not be today, you can ignore it for as long as you want, but the future is inevitable. And you can see it, there's multiple, there's multiple points of attack, whether it's the entrance of the new digital challengers, whether it is, whether it is the tech giants either out of China or out of Silicon Valley coming in, um, whether it is disintermediation of the customers, so open banking and, and allowing the customers to be, be disintermediated from the bank itself, and they're turning into commodity platforms. There's there's lots of things happening, so you can't you can't fight all of them. You can't stand still and hope that they won't happen because it is happening. So you need to make sure that you're moving and and, and staying relevant as you go. I think which is interesting as well is like it's not only happen, it's happening at all the layer, right? I mean, yeah. think of like you know. The, the, uh, so yes, the bank are looking at this, but the vendor are completely like, uh, even the traditional vendor have changed their product. Like we, if we look at Dovetail product today, back of like, we compare it of back in the days, that's not the same. If we look at FIS products, they migrate to the cloud, same for Finestra. So literally everyone is looking at this. Yeah. I, we're, we're running a little bit out of time and, uh, I, but I, I want to carry on talking. I, I want, if I may, one, one other question, because um, core banking, of course, is also typically the one part of the bank that never changes, right? It's the, it's the thing that's hardest to change. But, but you're bringing kind of the ability to change quickly, um, you know, literally in an instant. Um, but are there kind of any concepts of core banking that people really struggle? Is, is there like a, a different concept that, or construct? Yeah that people have to get used to in this new world that's very different from the old? Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about, about that so, different construct? So this is interesting, right? So the term core banking means different things in different regions and to different banks, right? So, so on the one extreme, what you have is that the core bank was everything, right? 
it was the ledger, it is the product, it is the reg reporting, it is the payment rails, it is the risk engines, it is the channels, right? So in, to, at one extreme, it is that if you go into a bank and we can see in some of the mainframes, like all of that would have existed, all of the customer onboarding, all of the customer management, all of the product, all of it would have sat in a single mainframe, right the way down to having the printer connected to it to print the statements, right? So on one end, there's that. Um, uh, over the last 20 years, I guess, that would have fragmented up slightly. So now the, what, what you tend, so when you move off the mainframes, what, and, and what the established vendors are doing is that, you know, the, 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 the core bank tends to be, it's still the product management and the, and the product ledgers. It would, it would contain some elements of the reg reporting, um, and then you'd, you'd, you'd bolt on or plug in your payment rails or your card rails, or, or you might bolt on your channel because it was, it was, it was, it became obvious that the channels were how the banks expressed themselves. So they might want to go a different path than buying the same one from the different vendors. Right. So then there's that piece in the, in the middle piece. And then there's where you come to with us and some of our, some of our immediate competitors, right. Which is everything is broken up and fragmented. Right. So now, I mean, what we call the core bank in reality, I mean, it is because I mean, it still, it still holds the balance. It still manages the accounts. It still, it still holds and records the transactions. Um, but, but we are now one component of what would be multiple components of what in, in the early days in the mainframe would have been a single box called the core banking platform. And, and it's interesting sometimes, I mean, cause I've sat in rooms with, with tier one banks with their, with their business line for something, whether it be credit or whatever, and they've been doing this for 25 years and they absolutely completely understand what the mainframe does. And then we show up and we go, and, and we'll, we'll be asked the question, right? Does your box do what that box does? And the answer is, no, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. That would be crazy, right? But but we would where, where we come in is, is that we can take that box, we can we can break it out, we can turn it into a modern target state platform where you have much more flexibility, much more speed, um, much more ability to be able to do different things on it, where it'll be able to do everything that that box does, but now you'll be able to do much more on it. But the but the journey from thinking that a core banking system is everything in a single box to now being a largely distribute, distributed distributed um, componentized platform with interconnected systems um, and all the, I mean, so yes, it, it looks like it's more complicated, but in reality, what it does is it stops the vendor lock-in. You're not going back to a single vendor for anything. Um, we know that different parts of the platform, uh, um, they, they move at different speeds or they develop at different speeds. And what that allows you is, is that if the core banking platform over a 10 year period has moved quicker than all the rest of them, and you want to flip it out or you want to flip out because regulation or technology has changed so that you're, your risk profiling or your or your your um, your KYC checking platforms should now be in a different platform. Well, then you can plug it out and plug in a new one, and that's the benefits you get from the new one. But that's that concept and that conceptual journey is is takes a bit of work. <laughs> I can imagine it's it's quite a leap for for people who've born and bred in in that one box kind of yeah. concept, isn't it? I guess for me, like one of the thing when like you know we saw the, the sat machine product was the concept of like no end of day start of day i love so, that yeah how like you know how do you convey how do you make people to go on on this change effectively because like you know often and especially with income and bands you mentioned like you know ops so the ops using the system is used to that all the process are designed around the concept of like you know end of the start of day. So it, I, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's not only a technology shift, right? It's also a mindset, mindset shift, isn't it? Well, 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 so there's a difference here though, right? So what we don't have, what we don't have is any form of our idea of a, of a platform shutdown uh, to be able to extract information to pass to downstream systems within Windows. So, I mean, it does have the concept because you have to have the concept because the bank has a, the bank has a booking period within a, within a window, right? So. So we, we still do have to be able to tell downstream systems we are flipping to the next day. So in theory, there is a notion of an end of day because it, it ends and it starts the next day, right? Mm -hmm. But for us, the clock that we run that basically acknowledges that it's able to tell the downstream system, we have moved, right? One of the reasons that we don't have to have a batch window though, so the reason that legacy systems used to have a batch window is that you need, you need, you need a static point where the underlying data set isn't changing anymore so that if, when you're extracting data out of it, you're extracting it from a, a static point in time, right? And that's the reason that you had to, so you had to shut down, you had to shut down the systems that were, that were pushing information into the database, get the database set for a period and then go, all right, give me the information so I can do something with it downstream. Um, the, the, the concept that we operate at, um, which 
which came from the way that Google and Amazon and these guys built their systems is that why do you need to wait for a period to do a, a single one shot extraction from the database? Why don't you just make it available to everybody all the time and they can decide whether they want to consume it immediately, hold it and batch them. Like let them figure out what they want to do with it. Don't constrain your, your, your core banking system to, to, to being limited because of the way that you extract your data. Just push it out straight away and then that way you never have to shut down. Brilliant. Seems so simple. Why didn't we do it years ago, right? <laughs> I guess technology has helped us get, get, get to this point. Okay. I, with that, I probably really do uh, need to wrap up. Uh, any final thoughts from, from you, Julie? Um, no, I think I'm just like very much looking forward or more innovation, you know, and like more people embarking seriously on this journey so that like, I mean, so that we don't, we don't like, I, I don't feel, really, I don't like categorizing in general. And it's a bit like, you know, it's time for not categorizing like Digibank and Neobanks versus incumbents in terms of technology. I think like, it's nice. I, I feel like, you know, in a year or two saying, yeah, it's an incumbent, they have legacy technology and like, they don't know, we, we'll be gone, right? And I, I, it's, 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 it's full of like, yeah, opportunities for the future. It's exciting, right? It's exciting, yeah. exciting times we live in. And Thank you, Liam, for, for joining us today and, and building our excitement. Um, really, really nice to have you along. Julie and I absolutely adore chatting with people like you who are knowledgeable and passionate about payments and much more than payments today. The, the, the entire evolution of, of the, the platforms on which uh, the future of financial services, the future of payments, let's say, will be built. We really also appreciate the support of our audience. If you've enjoyed this discussion, then please show your support by giving us a thumbs up, hitting subscribe and clicking on the bell to get notified when future new content arrives. Also, don't be shy about giving us feedback. We really appreciate your comments and suggestions for new topics and guests. But for now, that's all for this week. Catch you on the flip side. Resilience on its platforms, but also the bank's understanding of, its, of the resilience of its vendors. In a second, I've got to get the lights on. <laughs> <laughs>